Hey everybody, today I'm going to be showing you the amazing physics of the Wilberforce pendulum. And I'm going to be showing you how this relates and can help us understand quantum superposition. First, let's talk about what an oscillation is. A really good example of oscillation is a pendulum swinging back and forth. It's changing between the different states of having its energy completely in potential energy versus completely in kinetic energy at the bottom of the swing. Now pendulums are interesting and useful, but what becomes really interesting about the pendulums is when you put two pendulums on a string connected together. This is called a coupled oscillation. Now watch what happens when I swing one of the pendulums being coupled to the other pendulum. Okay, let's take this one and swing it. Whoa, it goes completely to the other one and then it switches back to the initial one then that one stops and the other one goes back and forth. So these two pendulums are now coupled together and they take turns oscillating. One goes and then the other one goes. And the other one almost completely stops while the other one swings. So when we have these two pendulums and they have the same period and it's fixed on a string, they act as a coupled oscillator. So the oscillation, it alternates between both of the pendulums. Now in the case of these pendulums, this is linear motion coupling with linear motion. But you don't have to have linear motion coupling in order to have coupled oscillators. For example, what if we took twisting and moving up and down linearly? Now the Wilberforce pendulum is really interesting. So I'm going to start it off with only linear motion. So I'm going to pull the spring down. All I have is a spring with a weight attached to it with some more weights at the end of it here. And I'm just going to pull it straight down and let it go. And what will happen is it will start to oscillate between linear motion and complete rotational motion. So it's going to very nearly stop its linear motion and then begin only spinning and then it will stop its spinning and go back to linear motion and it will oscillate between those two. So we're going to have coupled linear and rotational motion happening with the Wilberforce pendulum. Okay, let me try to pull it straight down here. So it suddenly starts spinning. Let's see if it can only go to rotational motion now and not bob up and down. Whoa! It completely stops bobbing up and down. And then the rotational motion slows down and it starts its bobbing once again. And let's see if it can completely stop spinning. Whoa! It completely stops. And then it goes back to its rotational motion So now it has this coupled motion between rotational and this linear bobbing up and down motion. So it's oscillating between those two. So it's a coupled oscillation between linear motion and rotational motion. This is so cool to watch. So somehow it's able to store the energy oscillating between rotational energy and then linear spring energy. So you can see the difference in its linear height when it wasn't spinning at all versus when it was spinning completely. Now the reason this is happening is because the resonant frequency of the translation oscillation, this motion, just equals the square root of the spring constant divided by its mass, this mass here. But then also the resonant frequency of spinning like this is equal to the square root of the torsion constant, the spring constant of torquing the spring like this, divided by the moment of inertia of the rotating body. So the moment of inertia of this, which changes depending on where you put these weights. So what's interesting is you can tune the moment of inertia to just about match the frequency of rotation to match the frequency of translational motion. And if you can get those to very closely match, just offsetting them a little bit, then what happens is it oscillates completely between rotational energy and translational energy. So the energy is basically bouncing back and forth and completely contained in rotation and then completely contained in translational motion. So the Wilberforce pendulum is a really cool example of two different states of motion that can be coupled together. 
Now what happens if you have more than two states coupled together or two pendulums coupled together? What I've done here is connected three steel balls to some sticks and then connected these with springs together. Now this type of setup has a few natural frequencies. The natural frequency means the frequency at which it wants to oscillate. The first normal mode is just two pi times the square root of length divided by g. And that mode is when you do this to them. So move them all at the same time. They go really well and they stay in that pattern. And then the next resonant frequency is two pi divided by the square root of g over l plus k over m. K is the spring constant here, and M is the mass of these. And this mode looks like this. And then the third mode is 2 pi over the square root of G over L plus 3K over M, where K is the spring constant. And in that case, you just have this motion here. And so it moves back and forth in its third normal mode. So how does any of this relate to quantum mechanics? Well, I showed you three different normal modes of this three pendulum setup here. So if I just take one of the pendulums and swing it back and forth, it's not one of the normal modes, but you can still describe it using the three known normal modes or the three normal frequencies. So if you just take the three normal modes and add them together in different amounts, you can describe anything that's happening in this system. Whether I move one like this or two like this, it can all be described by using different amounts of those three normal modes. And so when these three balls are not doing this, or this, or this, then what it means is that the state is in a superposition of all three of those states. So superposition isn't anything mystical in quantum mechanics. All it means is that you're adding different amounts of three states. So this actually relates directly to how we observe neutrinos being emitted from the sun. For example, let's say each of these pendulums represents a different type of mass state of the neutrino, an electron neutrino, a muon neutrino, and a tau neutrino. And the amplitude of that pendulum swinging represents the probability that we'll find the neutron in that state. So if this has a high amplitude, it means we have a high probability of finding it in that state. If this one has a high amplitude, it means we have a high probability of finding it as a muon neutrino. And if this one has a high amplitude, it means we have a high probability of finding it in the t as a tau neutrino. And if they're all just kind of bobbing back and forth at the same amplitude, it means we have equal probability of finding the neutrino as an electron, muon, or tau neutrino. Now when a neutrino is released from the sun, it starts off as a full probability of being an electron neutrino. So this has a high amplitude. But notice as time goes on, then these other ones start swinging as well because they're coupled together with the electron neutrino. So now, as time goes on when it finally hits the Earth, we actually don't find them completely as an electron neutrino, but we find they have equal probabilities of being an electron neutrino, a muon neutrino, or a tau neutrino. So notice how they're all just bobbing back and forth at around the same amplitude. Hey everyone, thanks for watching, and if you haven't checked out theactionlab.com, remember to go check it out and see the Action Lab experiment boxes. And if you haven't subscribed yet, consider hitting the subscribe button and the bell so you can be notified when I release my latest video. And thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.